Hi, welcome back. In our study of signals and systems and linear time invariant systems in particular, differential equations has been coming up quite a bit, the subject of differential equations. And in previous videos we saw that we could, actually at the in the first half of the course, we saw that we could represent linear time invariant systems in terms of the input-output relationship, in terms of the impulse response, and in terms of differential equations. And now we've been through Fourier transforms and we understand what a frequency response is. So really we can represent LTI systems in those four different representations. And so what, what we need still is for the complete picture is how to get the frequency response from a differential equation and vice versa. So that's what this video is for, is how we can relate a differential equation with the frequency response. So let's check it out. So first of all, we're, we are going to limit ourselves to differential equations that are so-called linear constant coefficient. Linear and constant coefficient differential equations. I'll just write diff EQ here for short. So a linear constant coefficient differential equation is something in the following form. I'm going to write AK here, but that's not a for a series coefficient. That is, um, that's just a constant. So AK times, and then I'll put the derivative the kth derivative of y like that equals and then we'll have a sum over here k equals 0 to m of bk's and these are again just these are just constants times the kth derivative of x of t Okay, so this is a linear constant coefficient differential equation. They are written in this form. So we have a constant, so that's the hence the constant coefficient part, a constant times the derivative, and we can have any number of derivatives here. So this would be an nth order differential equation because the output y depends on the nth nth derivative of y. So we can have any sort of summation of derivatives of y and any sort of derivatives or summation of derivatives um, in x. And the fact that there's a sum and they're not being multiplied together means that th this is a linear differential equation. So hence linear constant coefficient differential equation and it turns out that these things can express linear time invariant systems, which we've looked at in the past. So I'm just going to write an example of one. So if if n, capital N, were 2, we could have a constant coefficient differential equation like this. So I'll just pick some constants. Okay. equals All right. So here is a linear constant coefficient differential equation. So this is a second order. So capital N is 2. So we've got derivatives 0. Here's the 0th derivative. Derivative 1, there's the first derivative, and derivative 2, there's the second derivative, and the coefficients are 3, 4, and 1 respectively and then we have a sum of those things. And then on the right, we have um, m, capital M, is 1, so we have 0 to 1. Here's the 0th derivative of x, and this is the constant coefficient b0, 2. And then here's the m equals 1 first derivative of x, and the coefficient there is 1. Okay, so you see how this is a specific example of our general linear constant coefficient, diffie q, right over here. So, now, <clears throat> 
in this somewhere is a frequency response. How do we get it? This is describing a linear time invariant system. How do we get the frequency response? So what we're going to do is apply the linearity property, which you should have a good handle on by now. The linearity property allows us, we're going to take the Fourier transform of this equation, and the linear linearity property allows us to take the Fourier transform of each term separately and forget about the constants and just tack the constants on afterwards. That's what that's loosely what the linearity property says. So I'm going to take this piece first. So I'm going to look at, I'm going to use this notation where this is kind of like a script F, meaning Fourier transform of this piece, right? I'm going to probably run out of room. Let me shift that over to the left a little bit. Okay. Then the linearity property allows me to take four times the transform of dy dt and then plus three times the transform of y of t equals then the Fourier transform of dx dt plus two times the Fourier transform of x of t. You see that? So that's the linearity property. That should be good. Now, let's assume x of t, as we have been doing in the past notationally, has transform capital X and y has transform capital Y. Okay, so then we, if we make that assumption, now we can start hammering out these Fourier transforms. So for example, this third term on the left side, this is three times the Fourier transform of Y, so that's three times Y of J omega. And I'll get to the other terms in a second. And then on the right, the uh, this guy, two times the Fourier transform of X, that's going to be two times capital X, right? Now what do we do about the derivative terms? Well now we are going to apply the differentiation property, differentiation in time, differentiation property. Okay, so remember the differentiation property says that the derivative of X has Fourier transform j omega times x of j omega. So if I look at that, we'll start here, this first term on the right. The, the Fourier transform of that then is j omega times x of j omega. Straightforward application of the differentiation property. This term is 4 times the derivative of y, so its transform is 4 j omega y of j omega. Actually, let me give myself some more space. So this is y of j omega, 4 j omega, y of j omega. And then this guy, what am I going to do here when that, with the second derivative? Well, each time I take a derivative, I multiply by j omega. So this becomes j omega squared times y of j omega. And you could make the j minus 1 if you wanted to, because j squared is minus 1. However, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see j and omega as peanut butter and jelly, and I'm going to keep those guys together. So I'm not going to square the j. You'll see why in a little bit. So I hope you can read that. That's j omega squared times y of j omega, and then plus 4, and so forth. Okay, so we've applied these two properties now that we're experts <laughs> um, with these. And now, if you notice, on the left, every term has a y of j omega. So I can factor out y of j omega and I'm left with j omega squared plus 4 j omega plus 3 and then on the right every term has an x so I can factor out x of j omega times j omega plus 2. Great. Now let's recall what the frequency response is. Remember that if I put if I put x in, and so x has a spectrum, capital X, into the linear time invariant system, then what do I get out of the linear time invariant system? I get the frequency response 
actually let me let me back up let's say let's put it this way here's my here's my LTI system and it's got frequency response H so when I put in X I get out you remember what I get out from the multiplication property I get out X times H uh, excuse me that was the convolution property so this is the spectrum of Y so notice then that the frequency response is just the ratio of Y of J Omega to X of J Omega Y of J Omega to X right so over here I can solve for that ratio if I divide by Y over here I'll have X over Y and then divide by J Omega plus 2 I get that H of J Omega equals um, again X or not, not X Y of J Omega over X of J Omega and that's in this case that is equal to so I'm going to divide I think I said this backwards I'm going to divide by X and then divide by this thing J Omega squared plus 4 J Omega plus 3 so this gives me J Omega plus 2 over J Omega squared plus 4 J Omega plus 3 right and that is the frequency response neat you see this this differential equation that we started with is characterizing a linear time invariant system and it, you know described by this differential equation is this frequency response there it is now we might ask ourselves well what's the what's the impulse response then of this linear time invariant system so the impulse response is the inverse transform of this thing so let's find the inverse transform and uh, if the math gods allow for it we might be able to factor the denominator if not we can use the quadratic formula but let's see if we can factor it and this is why I'm keeping j omega as a variable to itself peanut butter and jelly notice I can I can make this j omega plus 3 times j omega plus 1 right and the reason I factored the denominator is because let me let me get myself some room is because oh, I'm gonna write it up here j omega plus 2 j omega plus 3 times j omega plus 1 so that I can write it using partial fraction expansion like this a is a constant and B is a constant and I need to figure out what those constants are and so I'm expanding the fraction and the reason I would do that is because I know what the inverse transform of a constant over J Omega plus 3 is it's related to the exponential it's in our table actually it's one that's come up quite a bit and I, I would know the inverse transform of this piece so let's use partial fraction expansion and I'm, I'm gonna give myself even more room um, I'm gonna erase this and I'm going to erase this and we'll erase that <laughs> for good measure anyway to get a now I said this in an example video but I'm gonna say it again I'm gonna use a method of partial fraction expansion that that I learned as an engineering student and I find that it's different than than most other students um, I encourage you to try my method. My method is faster and it can be done in my head. I think it can be done in your head. I'm very slow in math actually. So if I can do this in my head and quickly, then I, I, I bet you can do it in your head after you get some practice. But I'm gonna show the, the, the gory details at first until you get the hang of it. Um, what I'm gonna do is multiply, to get A, I'm gonna multiply this equation by A's denominator. So A's denominator is this thing. So I'm going to multiply the whole equation. So to get A, that's my A colon means to get A. Um, on the left, the J omega plus 3 cancels because I'm multiplying everything by J omega plus 3. 
on the right I just have a there and then I have b times j omega plus 3 over j omega plus 1 like this now this is an equation in j omega and so that means that it has to be true for all j omega and so I'm going to strategically choose one j omega j omega whatever makes a's denominator zero so minus three j omega equals minus three makes a's denominator zero and the reason I do that is to wipe out b you see because now we have zero over something non-zero so that wipes out b and I'm left with a equals j omega plus two so so that would be minus 3 plus 2 over minus 3 plus 1. So that is minus 1 over minus 2, right? So that is 1 half. Okay, so that's how you get A. And I bet you you can do B on your own and maybe even in your head. But um, I'll write it out again. Just to remind you, what we did here was multiply by the denominator of a and then set j omega equal to whatever makes that denominator zero. So we're going to do the same thing for b. To get b, multiply by b's denominator, okay, and then on the left I have this because the j omega plus one cancels and then I'm left with a times j omega plus one over j omega plus 3 plus b. Now I'm going to let j omega equal minus 1. That wipes out a's contribution and I'm left with b equals minus 1 plus 2 over minus 1 plus 3. So this is 1 half as well. Awesome. So now I can come back up to here and I can, remember this was y. I erased it. This was, or no, this was not y. This was h h of j omega. I erased it. That was h. So now I can write h of j omega is equal to one half times one over j omega plus three plus one half times one over j omega plus one. Okay? And then I want to remind you of one of the common Fourier transform pairs. So this was e to the negative a t u of t has a Fourier transform 1 over j omega plus a as long as a is greater than 0. Okay, so that's exactly what we have here in this first term with a equals 3. And why can I just consider the first term separately? That's because of the linearity property. Linearity allows me to consider this piece by piece and forget about the one halves and just write one half times. Now this piece has an inverse transform of, of e to the minus 3t u of t. Okay, and then the second piece then is one half e to the negative t u of t. And so then this is the inverse transform of capital H. So this is the impulse response. And so I can write this more compactly by factoring out the common terms. This is one half times e to the negative 3t plus e to the negative t times the unit step. That's it. So we have the frequency response and we have the impulse response of the system characterized by this linear constant coefficient differential equation. Now in the next video I want to show you how we can get the output of such a system. So stay tuned.